Hello and welcome back to The Hatch Season 4. I'm Rosie Murphy. And I'm Sammy Roth. And this is, as always, the podcast where we talk about Lost. This week we are watching Season 4, Episode 1, The Beginning of the End. And we've got the first part of a several-part conversation with the actor Rebecca Mader, who plays Charlotte Lewis and uh, makes her debut, not in this episode, but in the next one, as a member of the Freighter team. Let's not waste any time. Every week we start off the show with our hot takes on the episode we have just watched. Sammy, what is your hot take on the beginning of the end? So I, there's so many things to hot take about. As always, I know we say that every goddamn time. <laughs> um, I, I guess I just want to hot take a little bit about the character Matthew Abaddon, uh, played ah, by Lance Reddick. Um, I think he's he he makes a very dramatic entrance in this episode. Yes, yes. Um, you know, this mysterious. Uh, he is frightening. He's intimidating. He claims to be a lawyer from Oceanic Airlines. It's like. No, Oceanic Airlines does not care about Hurley's well-being so much to come mm-hmm. send a lawyer to check on him or whoever to check on him in, in the mm-hmm. mental institute. Like, no big corporation cares that much. I don't care. Um, but I uh, I was just – I was always disappointed that more did not come of that character. Like, he makes a few other appearances. They're always brief. They're always dramatic. Mm-hmm. Just felt like there would have been, you know, so much cool stuff they could have done, especially knowing that, you know, played by Lance Reddick, who's a, a fabulous actor um, – but definitely in in retrospect, it burns a little to know that um, this character wasn't really given a chance to shine because I think it, it, it could have been really fun to see to see more of this guy, especially with his, his name, Abaddon. It's like this biblical sort of destruction demon kind of character. I, the details aren't clear. The lost Wikipedia page is a little weird, but it's, it's some yeah, type it's, of it's biblical reference. It's someone who's referenced in the Book of Revelation, which is like this apocalyptic book at the end of the Bible. And it appears like it it's either like Satan or the devil himself or some kind of demon closely associated with him, as I understand Right, or an it. evil angel of some kind yeah. having to do with the abyss, like... Et cetera, et cetera. Very promising character. Lance Reddick does good work with what he's given, but there mm-hmm. there could have been more. Yeah, and it you get the feeling a little bit that it's... I, I felt like as they continued with his character and he appears in one of, you know, John Locke's flashbacks encouraging him to go on the walkabout and stuff that it was kind of like, oh, you're, we're writing this in after the fact to make it seem a little orchestrated or like orchestrated in a way. It's kind of like what happens with Jacob and Richard Alpert when they begin showing up in everyone's sure. flashbacks. It's like, oh, this, like, person yeah. is, this is a person of great mystery. But yeah, with him, it's never quite borne out. Right. With Jacob and the man and uh, Richard Alpert, like it, it, it definitely feels very like prophetic. Whereas with right. Matthew Abaddon, you still are left at the end, Mac. But who was this guy again? Like, was he right. really who, just who was a, he working for exactly? A henchman and... of Widmore. I mean, that's the implication. I think yeah. that ultimately they worked for Widmore, but it's, it's just a little, it's a little underwhelming. Well, anyway, it's a good uh, take. love, love Lance Reddick. What's your hot take, Rosie? So, I, I guess one of the things that struck me in this episode is how it becomes very, very clear how much Charlie meant to Hurley. You know, he ends up making the decision to go with John Locke and not trust these people who are supposedly here to rescue them because Charlie died, right? I mean, that's kind of the reasoning he presents is, well, this is what Charlie died for. And when he's at uh, the Santa Rosa Mental Institution and, you know, the, the, the person who appears to him is not anyone else, right? It's not his parent, any of the people from his pre-island past. It's Charlie. And I guess I, I was struck, I guess, by how much Charlie seems to have meant to him. I guess I didn't, didn't quite realize that. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a good observation. It's um you know, I mean they've had they had some big moments together in season three, right? Like they drove mm-hmm. the van down the hill together, um, is one of them that comes to mind. They uh you know, they, they got drunk that night with Desmond where Desmond revealed that Charlie was supposed to die. Um so I mean they've been through some things, yeah. but I think that and, and this probably takes us out of, you know, hot take territory mm-hmm. into, you know, substantive discussion of the episode, but I I think the first time this aired, I remember being a little bit underwhelmed by it as a series premiere, a season premiere. This was going to be my hot take, but I thought it was too risky. (laughs) Well, I'll I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why I think so, and then tell me what you think. But my my perspective has changed on it a bit. I Mm -hmm. I, I remember the first time being a little underwhelmed because it it felt like after all of the high drama at the end Mm -hmm. of season three that this was an episode that, that slowed things down quite a bit. 
and and yeah. you know, and it was an episode that was really anchored on what you just identified, which is the you know the bond between Hurley and Charlie mm-hmm. and this very emotional moment for Hurley, which is sort of the centerpiece of the you know the story of this episode where he explains that you know he's going to go with with Locke because mm-hmm. that's um, you know Charlie died to give them this message and he needs to honor Charlie's sacrifice, and and at the time I definitely think that that one that 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 felt a little bit like, you know, just a, a plot let down that this is what mm-hmm. this episode was about after how season three ended. And, and two, a little bit less than overwhelming emotionally because I, I did not have a ton invested in the Hurley-Charlie relationship, or frankly, as our listeners will know by now in Charlie, which, you know, I'm sorry if you've been listening to The Hatch up until this point, you you got to be used to it by now. I'm, I'm sorry, Charlie is not our absolute <laughs> favorite character Indeed. on The Hatch. Please forgive us. Um, yeah. I think that this this watch... I felt a little bit differently about it. I, I, I got some goosebumps watching Hurley's speech this time. Like, mm-hmm. knowing what was coming, I was a little mm-hmm. bit prepared for what this episode brought, that it's it's really a little bit of a breather with a, a build-up, build-up, build-up until you get mm-hmm. to Daniel Faraday landing at the end, which is really the event that, you know, sets all of the sets balls back in motion, in motion yeah. um, for the rest of the year and really for the next three seasons. But but it, it, at the time, I had some some problems with it. So does that does that line up at all with with how you felt now or originally? Yeah, I mean, in the first three seasons, the season premiere was something very special. It introduced us to something new. Pilot is obvious. Uh, the season two premiere begins with the Desmond sequence, which we so love, and then the season three premiere begins with you know the book club and the plane class, the right. plane crash from the other's perspective. Absolutely, and here classic it's just like, sequences. This is happening minutes after the end of the finale, but it's, you know, months have passed by the time you're watching this as a viewer, and it's just like, we're picking up immediately. You know, there there's not a chance to reset, which is what previous season premieres had offered, I think, and yeah, it is it is a little anticlimactic in a lot of ways, because it doesn't set up any new storylines, really. It just continues what, you know... Well, obviously, very, very great and important storylines were sort of seeded at the end of season three. But yeah, I mean, with the exception of what's taking place in the future, like, but, e- but even that is in in many ways just a continuation of the scene from the end of season forward. three. We have yeah. to go back. No, yeah. but it's but it, you're right. It's it's it. It continue. You're right. It continues everything that happened at the end of season three, but in a way that can't possibly match the drama of what was happening mm-hmm. at the end of season three, because that was the finale, which is maybe more, more a statement about through the looking glass than the beginning of the end. But it's just like you're right. If it's if it's a direct continuation, which it really is, it's just not possible to live up to what had come immediately before. Right. So I mean, I, let me let me let me say something different now. Yeah. I do think that there is a lot to appreciate in this episode that I appreciated more on this mm-hmm. viewing than I did the mm-hmm. first time. Um, I think that the all of the the hints that are being dropped in the flash forward are quite cool. Like, mm-hmm. ooh, who are the Oceanic Six? And yeah, and there's I, I even realized... one point where Jack says, "I'm thinking about growing a beard," which is a yeah. great <laughs> callback to the end of season three, and we have to go back where he, you know, has this like scraggly beard. Yeah. Right. It, it starts to make you like question like, okay, how are these pieces going to fit into the place? Mm-hmm. You know, who mm-hmm. are the rest of them? You know, when, when Abaddon asks Hurley, you know, are they still alive? Right. You got, you stop and you realize, wait, we don't, we don't actually know if they're still alive. And yeah, I mean, you and I know right. we've seen the show. Right. Well, and, and Hurley says to Jack, like, you think I'm going to tell? And yeah. Tell what? what? What is the secret? Yeah. Right. That is As very, it, very good. And, and, um, and that's stuff that I think that it was maybe a little bit lost on me at the time because, you know, the first time you watch, I mean, you're so the on island is really the story. Uh huh. Like, I don't know. I feel like the flash forwards. Um, it's easier to appreciate the flash forwards now when you can see the big picture. Like, yeah. I just feel like the first time you you were so invested as I was in what was happening on the island that that felt real, and the flash forwards still felt like not quite real yet. Oh, I don't know if I agree with that. I think I I remember feeling like. I have to know who the Oceanic Six are, and I know it's going to take all season. Maybe part of it is just that it was, and I mean no disrespect to Hurley, who's a wonderful character, but, Mm -hmm. you know, Hurley episodes just in general do not have the same kind of intensity as, you know, a Jack episode or a Locke episode or Ben or Desmond or Juliet. And, you know, you typically associate, like, the Hallmark, Hallmark, the landmark episodes of the show with one of the high drama characters. So it was... 
it was an interesting choice to start this season, you know, rather than with one of those characters who's usually like one of those big, big bang, you know, bang bang episodes, but with Hurley instead. It's a little bit, it's a little bit softer and gentler. Not, and 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 I, I appreciate that a lot more mm-hmm. right now than I think I did at the time. Maybe that was part of why, yeah. it, you know, my recollection was that it was an underwhelming premiere. Well, and the way the episode starts is really interesting, I think, because it's it's a super dramatic flash forward sequence with Hurley in the car chase and then getting arrested and the cop was Anna Lucia's former partner and he has that vision of the wall breaking and being flooded and stuff. And then when they flash back or presently back to the island, um, it's almost like the way the flashbacks sometimes look, which is like, look how peaceful and beautiful this thing was before we got into this time of chaos, which is not like definitely not all the time how the flashbacks feel, but there are moments when it feels like that. And, um, the island feels that way because as soon as we get back to the island, the feeling is, oh my God, it worked. We're going to leave. Um, you better pack your bags. Um, oh, hot. Charlie's our hero. We're really, you know, this whole sequence about how we're really going home. Yeah. They're um, really laying it on thick. It takes a while <laughs> for the island to become the center of like real intensity, I think. For sure. I mean, I think it, it starts to happen that, Despite my kind of you know semi sarcastically saying they're laying it on thick, it's a little heavy handed, but I, yeah. I do love them. I love the you know after Hurley's cannonball, um, he comes out of the water and it just it turns so quickly. He's yeah. happy, he's giddy, and then as soon as his head comes up, basically the music darkens and you see mm-hmm. the canoe coming in and you can tell they're all like intense about something and it's like oh no like. Not everything is right here. It just, it turns on a dime. And it's like, we should have known that was, you know, we should know that's coming because of not Penny's boat. But I just wanted to also give Jack a little bit of grief. Um, one, because... Would it in, be in, an episode of The Hatch if you did not? No, it would not. And I, I hope you'll, <laughs> I hope you'll join me here. Uh, but he, he's so, you know, he's so optimistic. He's so happy. He, you know, promises everyone, no, 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 don't worry. It's fine. We're going home. Mm-hmm. Like, there's, there's definitely a, I mean, this is, Maybe this is the hindsight talking, but I'm watching this thing. Really, Jack? Like, you don't want to be a little bit cautious? Like, there's not any part of you that's a little nervous about this now? Like, it, he just seems to want it so badly that he... I mean, and please, you know, call us and tell us mm-hmm. if you disagree. 9546 Dharma, leave us a hot take. We'll play it next <laughs> week. 9546 Dharma, tell us we're wrong. But it, I just, I'm watching this and I'm thinking, like, shouldn't he, shouldn't he be a little more careful here? Like, yeah. I don't know, what do you think? Just in how he's portraying this to everyone. I mean, a lot of what Jack does is, I think he he sees himself as the leader, and so he has to act the part, even if he has private doubts. And I think we've seen him do that before, is kind of keep his doubts from the group in an effort to keep morale up or to keep everybody on track. Um, So if he does have private doubts in this moment, I don't think he wants to share them because I was like, what good would it do? Um, like He's we're all up here. And, hopes up. Yeah, but like. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> you know, I it's, it's yeah, and and for much of you know for the first half of the episode, the only detractor you really have is Ben. Um, and you know, Rousseau punches him at one point. You know, Ben is repeatedly punched. Um, oh yeah, and sort of told to <laughs> shut up. And I understand why Jack believes at this point that Ben is a liar and. And honestly, when when John Locke shows up, I can see how Jack would also think, "Come on, this again! Like you have you have done everything in your power to keep us from leaving this island." Of course, then he tries to shoot John Locke, which is a, a different thing. But you know, I, I I can see how the the things that show up to detract Jack from getting off the island are things that. Of course, he's going to disregard because they're the mm. they've been the detractors this whole time. That's that's reasonable. That's reasonable. I mean, I know that I know that he doesn't really know what's coming. Anyway, the sources that are telling him this mm-hmm. are not reliable sources. That's fair. I mean, they do end up being right. Yeah, and it's hard to watch this not knowing that. I guess right. I was also annoyed with Jack just because of the way he dismisses Kate. Um, Kate having found the correct trail the for trail. Naomi. It, it's kind of patronizing. I mean, I know that we, we've, we've gone through this before. It's the thing he does all the time, which is, yeah. 
oh, Kate, I want to protect you, so you'd better go home, despite the fact that you have skills that we need. Right, skills that I don't have, which is tracking <laughs> people. Ja- oh, Jack's well. line to Kate is, um, God, it's so patronizing. Find her then. She could have created a dummy trail. I think we should follow both, just in case. Six hours from now, we're going to be sitting on that boat laughing about the fact that there was one final thing that we couldn't agree upon. Naomi is hurt. She ran into the jungle. She's not thinking about leaving fake trails. Ugh. Anyway. Yeah, that's, so maybe that's partially why I'm annoyed with Jack as well. <laughs> That's that's fair. Yeah. The um the moment where blood starts to drip on Kate from above is oh, truly it's terrifying. terrifying. Naomi makes Mikhail uh Bakunin look, you know, like like nothing. I mean she she gets shot in their knife through the back and gets up and crawls through the jungle and crawls back to leave a false trail and climbs up a tree and overpowers Kate while she is apparently on the verge of death. That is, she's tough as fuck. And is still able to send a coded message to the freighter. Ah, yes. You tell my sister tell. I love her. So do we Do we want to talk about the, the big scene? Yeah, we probably do. <laughs> um, where, where do you want to start with the big scene? Oh, gosh. I mean, tensions are obviously high, but... One of the things that's interesting about this to me is that, like, the aborted gunshot is, like, the first thing that happens. Yeah. It's I was like so Jack surprised. Jack was going to I... shoot first and ask questions later, or not ask questions. Um, all of the conversation follows that, which is like, oh, oh, dear. You know, we started this at a very, very intense place. I agree. In in my mind, there had been more build up to that. Yeah, same, like, same. I thought it was like the climax, and no, it was just the beginning. Yeah, Jack. I mean, to Jack's, I don't know if it's to his credit or not, but he says to Kate at the beginning of the episode, "If I see Locke again, I'm going to kill him." And Jack says shit like that, but then he actually, I mean, he, he right. followed through. Right. He, that's what that was his intention. He was going to do it. How how do you feel? Was it was it was it justified for him to pull the trigger? I mean, don't, let's not get into his murder ever justified. I mean, no, you know, but yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, like, what is he afraid of at this point? Like, if I guess if the freighter is, you know, ignoring everything that we know in the episodes following this, why? What is the point at this point? Like, Jack has won, right? Is but he might Locke of- still stop them somehow? Yeah, I guess. I mean, he did blow up the submarine mere moments before Jack was going to get on it and leave the island. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. But I don't know. I don't know. To me, it seems a a little like an overreaction, but what do you think? I don't know. I I didn't have a strong opinion coming into this conversation, but at this moment, I feel like, yeah, you know, Locke, Locke threw a knife through Naomi's back. He blew up the sub. Like, if I'm Jack, I... I you see, the thing is, yeah. the, the way I'm trying to justify it in my head is that Locke could actually prevent them from getting off the island. Like, mm-hmm. what if, you know, what if when another rescuer shows up and Locke throws a knife through their back too? Mm-hmm. Like, are these people really going to, you know, keep trying to rescue them in that circumstance? Like, that's a legitimate question. But it, it doesn't really seem like that's why Jack does it. It seems like it's more about, you know, vengeance or, you know, just... You know, Locke is bad, Locke is wrong, you know, he can't keep doing this, he deserves to die. Like, it it doesn't seem like Jack has really thought this through as this is a rational thing that we need to do to make sure that we can really leave. I agree with that. I think he is, his anger at Locke has reached such a fever pitch. I guess I'm just surprised that it hasn't abated a little bit. Um, Like, at the beginning of the episode, I get why he might have been in that place. It's right after... Locke has thrown the knife through Naomi's back, right? But they've confirmed that the freighter's on their way. You know, Naomi hasn't given them up, uh, you know, to their to the best of their knowledge. I guess... I'm surprised that Jack was able to sort of jump back so quickly to a level of anger at which he's able to grab a gun and try to shoot a man in the head. Because he Fair. seemed like he was in a pretty good mood, you know, minutes before. 
Yeah, I mean, of course, it's not just the the thing with Naomi. Of course, it's the build mm-hmm. up of all of mm-hmm. the tension between Jack and Locke. But I'm, I'm I'm with you on that, Jack. You know, I think what it, I think it just comes back to. I mean, we've seen we, what we have seen again and again with Jack is that he has a, he has a temper and he follows. Yeah. You know, I mean, he's just he feels things very strongly, and he doesn't always follow his head. And yeah. You know, even though there's, you know, maybe a follow your head version of this, it's, it definitely doesn't seem like he's doing that here. He seems yeah. to, I mean, we, we've seen Jack be impulsive before, just never, you know, never to the point of, I'm, I'm going to, you know, shoot a man in cold blood. Right. But maybe it shouldn't be that surprising. Yeah. Yeah, a lot has happened to get us to this point. It's also interesting that Locke, when he had the gun to Naomi, that it wasn't loaded. Yeah. Um, when he had the gun to Jack, excuse me. But I just think it's interesting that Locke was never going to shoot Jack, but Jack didn't hesitate to shoot Locke. Yeah. Speaks in Locke's favor. I think. Hard hard to tell at this point, but no, I I am inclined to agree. I don't think we can, we can, you know, finish our discussion of this episode without just appreciating the amazing delivery of uh, Michael Emerson's laugh lines in this episode. Uh, I did. I did want to give a shout out to um... Jack. With your permission, I'd like to go with John. And then there was also um... Kate took it when she hugged you. She found the right trail too, but you wouldn't listen to her. So I guess she's taken matters into her own hands. But look on the bright side. At least somebody around here knows what the hell they're doing. Yes, indeed. Oh, man. And he's, you know, he's not wrong. <laughs> no, he's he not. Usually isn't. Do you think in, sorry, another random thing, in Hurley's flash forward, is Charlie really there or is he in Hurley's head? I think he's in Hurley's head. Okay. I mean, one thing Lost has been pretty consistent about is that people don't come back from the dead unless they are animated by the man in black, right? No. Really? Mostly. The whispers. Michael. We get we get Michael... A lot, you know, a real ghost Michael in season six on the island explaining that the whispers are the people who cannot move on. On the other hand, that's, that's on the island. Yeah, cause, well, it's on the island. Yeah, also, and it's not like a corporeal happened. body. That's right, true. Right, it's just whispers. I think. Well, no, and then and then we get even more. We get Hurley talking to, um, Hurley can talk to the dead, like Richard Alpert's dead wife on the island, and we see her, but in... So Hurley can talk to the dead. Oh, that's an interesting point. I had forgotten about that. Yeah. So he could had, be real. He could be. They, mm, that's an interesting point. It's a weird combination because like Hurley does make him go away when he like closes his ears and shouts to himself and closes his eyes. But it, uh, you know, I, I feel like I've quoted this on... on um, our podcast once before, but it's like Dumbledore says at the end of Deathly Hallows, Mm -hmm. of course this is happening on your head, in your head, but why on earth should that mean it isn't real? Yeah. Like, I feel like there's some weird middle ground between Hurley imagining shit and, yeah, they're really there. Yeah, and it's specific to Hurley. Yeah. Because Dave, Dave was never really there, right? We were led to believe at the time in season two that Dave was not really there, but maybe we should reevaluate Dave. Hmm. I don't really want to reevaluate Dave. Dave. <laughs> I mean, Dave makes less sense because he didn't die on the island. Not, yeah, but neither did Richard Alpert's wife. No. No. But, and Charlie died on the island, but appears off island. Yes. Uh, I don't know. The man in black, or yeah, the man. Right, uh, gosh, it's. I, I'm there's open a part of suggestions on this one. I don't have a. I am sure we're going to have some listeners who will hear this and think, "You guys are such idiots." They explain this perfectly well. It means this, 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 and this. And if that's so, fine. I would Tell love us to that know and, about that. Right, but I, I, I think it's, I think it's got to be open to interpretation to an extent. Yeah. Ah. Hmm. Do you have um we always end this is you know starting season 4 we'll explain how we do things here we always end our discussions before we get into the interview with a uh, a hindsight something that is different in hindsight having seen the whole show Rosie do you have any hindsights about the beginning of the end Yeah so I guess now is a good time to talk about Jacob's cabin Oh good um, that's my hindsight too So of course Hurley can see the cabin um 
the cabin moves in ways that I don't understand. Um, and of course, this time, Christian Shepherd is the one in the cabin, as opposed to briefly Rob Kiker from season three. Yeah. <laughs> um, Rob, Rob Kiker, Kiker, who's the, the prop master uh, of the show, who sat in for Jacob and the man behind the curtain, who we will have as a guest on the podcast this year, yes, uh, talking about being the master of the props and also filming that scene. Yes. Um, but yes, this time it is it is Christian Shepherd in the flesh, and you can tell because it, we linger a little bit longer with him, longer than like a single frame. Yeah, just a lot of forces at work here. Um, of course, you know, we, we assume now that that's the man in black sitting in the cabin. So I don't know. That's that's, of course, something that we know now in hindsight is that the man in black has taken this form and is not that far away from a, the plot I hate with where Claire goes off into the jungle and becomes his number two and carries around the terrifying baby. And yes, ugh. which, uh, by the way, I'll speaking of Rob Kiker, he tells us the story, which you'll hear later this season of making the Claire baby prop. <laughs> the oh, my gosh. Weird jungle um, baby. Um, so, yeah, d- disappointingly, it reminds me that we're not that far away from that. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I, d- I don't have anything specific to offer about how this scene is different, except, of course, we know now what this is. Yeah, I, I have a similar feeling to you, which is that it it's a little bit as much. I enjoyed the cabin stuff, I think, more in, on original watching of the show mm-hmm. because it was just so cool and mysterious. Um, but in retrospect, it's like. The cabin stuff just never makes a ton of sense, which not that it needs to make sense, but yeah, it leads to the, it it reminds you of the disappointing Claire storyline and the fact that the cabin just ultimately is unceremoniously burned down by Alana and her team in season six. Like, they're just, it, it, the, the cabin stuff never really held together. The one thing I did like about it here after it moves, it's like one, there's the question of. Is it in Hurley's head, or did it mm-hmm, really move mm-hmm. temporarily? Which is a, a clever trick of the writers, I think. And it a is, nice and, sim- and similar to Charlie appearing off island, like it's left to mm-hmm. interpretation. But I, I do think that if you want to interpret it as the cabin moves, um, that it's a it's sort of a way of the show telling us like things are about to get weird. Like mm. Lost was a linear show up till now. Mm-hmm. Like things happened, even with the flash forward reveal, it's still like dealing with you know kind of normal human events. Um, I mean, we've seen the smoke monsters, so we know it's mm-hmm. not all, you know, like mathematical We've seen a little bit of supernatural stuff. But I feel like this is a little bit of a mission statement here going into the back mm. end of the show of, like, shit's going to get strange. Like, cabins that's, are moving around. That's very interesting, and that, that makes it even more interesting, I guess, that, that this season starts with Hurley because it does introduce that question of how much of this is in his head, if any. And Hurley's the only character with whom we experience that, right? Everybody else, when you know, when we're seeing things through their eyes, we can sort of trust that they're real. Right. Maybe they don't have right. the whole picture, but they they don't introduce this element of can you really trust this narrator? Um, where Hurley does introduce that, and that that's interesting. I wonder if that's because that that does take the viewer into a place of like, can we really trust? this narrator <laughs> in the sense of like the whole can we tell you know is the show no it's true it's true messing with us in that same way it's interesting well the other interesting thing about hurley of course is that he ends up taking jacob's place on the of island course, yeah. um which which i mean i think has a connection here to why he's finding and seeing the cabin in the jungle um mm-hmm. there seems to be a you know to me a right. line between his ability to commune with the dead potentially and see the cabin and stumble upon it when nobody else can find it, as, which comes right. back and later don't, this year. don't later John and possibly also Ben take Hurley with them because they need right. to find the cabin? That's right. Yeah. Um, so I think that there's a line between all that and, and his becoming yeah. the new Jacob, the new man in charge And this the connection end. that he has to the island that he doesn't and, recognize as such yet. Yeah. And that's another, I mean, I... This, maybe this doesn't all hang together coherently, but I feel like that ties into what you're saying about the you know this this unreliable narrator thing and the fact that the fact that this is I mean the title of the episode the beginning of the end this is the start of the second half and the final mm-hmm. act of this show um, you know we know it's all you know it's all kind of one string that's going to play out from here and it's it's very very interesting that it starts with Hurley that we have yeah, that Hurley ends up playing this role that we know he does mm-hmm. that. You know, his narration is, you know, as you put it, unreliable, that he has this weird connection with the island where we don't really know if he's seeing reality or not. Like, mm-hmm. 
I'm not sure what I'm getting at here. I just think it's very interesting that it's interesting though. Yeah. Yeah. That that this is how the this is how the end is beginning with with Hurley and with these particular themes. Yeah, with things that move, with things that may or may not be real in the the sense that we mean, right? And right. Yeah. Well, and that kind of even a, applies to the the freighter in a way, right? Like it's real, but it's not what it pretends to be, which is different. But there's something there's something bigger happening here. There's something thematic with the show yeah. that's, that's shifting into this point where where really everything we see and that happens, like we're going to question it. We're going to question, mm. I mean, the just sort of baseline yeah. reality of it. Yeah. Um, which maybe explains why so many people thought that the ending of the show meant that the whole thing was a dream or they were dead the yeah. whole time. Or, um, yeah. Which, which, is, which is wrong, but like you can, sort of, you can sort of see that here. Like the show is, is moving in a, a direction where you can't trust your eyes a lot of the time. Yes. Yes. And you're going to have to think even harder about what stuff means, not just in the sense of can I pause on the blast door map and figure out what everything leads to, but is this really there at all? Right. Like the eye yeah. in the cabin. Yeah. Yeah. Is that eye really there at all? Yeah. Um, I looked that up, by the way, and apparently there was this random actor, Jorge Garcia said at one point on the Geronimo Jackson podcast that this random actor named like Simon Elbling or something played the eye in the window. And then he came back as like some random Dharma functionary in season five, which I was a little disappointed that it wasn't also Rob Kiker. Uh, (laughs) Apparently it wasn't. Reprising his role as cabin guy, (laughs) cabin specter. Yeah. (laughs) I think that we should, I think that we should keep these ideas in mind as we talk about season four, because it's, it's just again, it's just so interesting that this is how they're setting setting the tone and setting the stage for not only this season, but you know, as the title of the episode mm-hmm. implies, for the three seasons to come. Beginning of the end. What a good what a good chat that was. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let's, this is why we do this podcast. <laughs> uh, yes. Oh, we have so much fun. Um and then the I mean the other reason we do this podcast is because We've had wonderful opportunities to interview cast and crew and people who worked on and around the show. Um, this spring, of course, we have all been um, spending most of our time in our homes uh, as the you know the world lives through the the COVID nineteen pandemic, um, which has given us a great opportunity to chat with some folks who um, are not currently producing television and movies. Um, so we are going to start off. Season four here with Rebecca Mater, who, of course, played Charlotte Staples Lewis, uh, the anthropologist who will show up next episode and then, of course, stay with us for a season and a half. Um, We had a really lovely uh, extended conversation with Rebecca. She was very generous with her time. You're going to hear from her uh, over a a couple of episodes here with us. Um, And she's just got all kinds of of wild and fun and illuminating stories. truly hilarious stories. (laughs) Things that happened on the set of Lost. She's she's really fun. All right, let's go. We're here with Rebecca Mater, who, of course, played Charlotte Lewis on Lost. Rebecca, thank you so much for being with us on the Hatch Podcast. We appreciate it. You're welcome. Happy to be here. Yeah, so I guess, you know, let's start at the beginning. Um, mm-hmm. How did you get cast on Lost? <laughs> it was 13 years ago. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I know. Okay. It's funny, when um, when I, I my manager reached out to me about this podcast, I'm like, oh, my God, I hope I remember it. <laughs> it's been <laughs> such a long time ago. Um, but um, so I think it was like July 2007, and I... I um, Everyone was watching it, right? It was 2007. It had been on for three years. I was probably the only one of my friends that didn't watch it. Everybody thought I was a complete muppet. Like, what is wrong with you? Why aren't you watching Lost, you weirdo? And I'm like, all right, all right, I'll get to it. Calm down. But what had happened was I I watched the pilot in 2004. And back in the day, I wasn't really into sci-fi. Now I'm really into sci-fi. I love it. But back then, I just, I don't know, it was a long time ago. And, you know, your taste change. And I remember when I first saw a polar bear in the jungle, because I love disaster movies where hilarious that we're now in one in a pandemic. But, I, you know, I love like the end of the world, we're all going to die type movies and shows. So then when I saw a polar bear, I'm like, oh, it's sci-fi. And I gave up on it. <laughs> and then three years later, um, 
I was living in LA in Los Feliz and like I get this email for an audition for Lost and I'm like, oh shit, I should have been watching it. I'm like, oh no. And then I thought, well, you know what? I really want to be on it now, now that it's a huge hit and everybody watches it. And um, at the time I had just um, watched The Secret, <laughs> which is like a rip off of any kind of law of attraction thing, but it was like really hot <laughs> back in 07. And I was like, I'm just going to manifest it. I'm just going to believe it. So I, I went to Barnes and Noble back because this is like pre-streaming, right? So I went to Barnes and Noble and I got season one and two on DVD. And as I was paying for it, I'm like, I'm preparing for my role that I've already got. I hadn't even been on the audition yet. <laughs> so I, I, I started watching it and then I'm like, oh no, this is really, really good. You idiot. Where have you been? <laughs> I'm like, doy. And so then I'm like really invested and then I really wanted it. And I'm like, well, I hope that doesn't ruin my audition because now I'm invested. I might get nervous. Anyway, I went in for like a, a pre-read with the casting director and initially the, the, the role of Charlotte Staples Lewis was supposed to be American. And they were like, think like a female Indiana Jones. And so I went in like my greens and my khakis on. I'm like, I've got this. And I did it in an American accent. And she's like, okay, great. And I said, can I do it again in an English accent? She's like, well, and I sort of did and I'm like I think I don't know I think it's cooler but whatever and then I got a call back I'm like oh my god I'm gonna get it I'm gonna get it I know it I just I'm I was really into manifesting and at the time and and I so I went back to the callback and my manager said it's between you and five other people I'm like oh I didn't need to know that I live on a need to know Ooh. basis I don't want to like focus on other people right so I get there and there's these five like gorgeous girls sitting there and I'm like nope nope rolls mine Thanks for coming, everybody, but it's mine. <laughs> and then I went into the room and Damon and Carlton were in there. And um, I just had this feeling that I thought, I cannot, I cannot leave this room until they see me and see who I am, not just this character, you know. And um, so I just sort of shot the shit with them and was being myself and being stupid and silly, which I am. And making them laugh and taking the piss. And then they were like, okay, great. Well, shall we, uh, shall we get started? And I looked at them and I went, is there really any point? I hadn't even done the audition. <laughs> I hadn't even done the audition yet. And I went, I mean, you might as well just call my agent. And I left. I like went out the room, <laughs> pretended to leave. <laughs> and they were like, Rebecca, where are you going? I'm like, I mean, I said, well, you know what? I've learned the lines. I'm here. <laughs> I might as well just do it. And they were like, you're a nutter. So I did it. And then I did it English. And I'm like, I said, I really think this character should be British, like a sexy British Indiana Jones. And they were like, okay. <laughs> so they did. And they, you know, I've, I've read interviews with Damon and Carlton who are hilarious, who I love. And they've, they'd seen an interview of mine where I had mentioned the whole secret thing. And Damon or Carlton, was, one of them said, apparently we have no choice in casting Rebecca Lady because she was manifesting. <laughs> but then later, later on, they did say that one of the reasons, one of them, um, you know, one of the reasons I got the part was because of my personality, which is funny because I had that thought going, they must see that I'm just like a normal person. I'm not like an actress mm. kind of person, you know. And um, they said that was really important to them because, you know, they're shipping everybody off to an island and it was really important that they found someone that wasn't, you know, egotistical or a nightmare because, you know, you, they were shoving people into this pre-existing family. So they thought, oh, Rebecca will make everybody laugh, you know. Fuck it, let's give the part to her. So that's really how I got the part. <laughs> I have to say that I, I had a similar experience to you starting Lost, and I, I don't know if I've shared this on the podcast. I watched the first couple episodes too and didn't get into it. Oh, really? Um, yeah, which is strange in retrospect. I don't know. I don't know what I was thinking either because it's <laughs> you know you go back and watch and it's phenomenal. But I also had to end up kind of speeding through the first two seasons to catch up and get to that point. Mm -hmm. um, less important for me than it was for you, obviously. <laughs> Still important, nonetheless. Still important. Still important. But, but I found out after I did that callback. I didn't find out for ages that I got the part because at the time I didn't have a green card. So I think the network or the studio was concerned about my visa status. I ended up having my visa was perfectly fine, but there was like a whole thing about like, does she need to be American or, you know, citizen or green card? So, so my team had to sort of like not tell me for ages that I was the front runner in case it all fell apart and they broke my heart. But then anyway, they ended up calling going, you, you, that's it. You're leaving in like three days. You're moving to Hawaii. I'm like, what? I mean, I legitimately couldn't believe it. But then I had to watch three seasons 
in a really short period of time to catch up for my entrance in episode 402 that I had to watch like at least, I mean, one day, I think I watched 10 in a day. And what was really, really cool was I flew out to Hawaii for my first episode and they put all the actors up in the same hotel. And I'm in this hotel and I was waiting for Transmo to pick me up for my first day of work. And I wasn't getting picked up and sort of till later in the day. So I was like, right at the end of season three and like the whole world was like, wow, wow. And they're all like <laughs> sitting on the dug going, Wah. and then boof, it was over. And then I get a phone call going, they're ready for you. And I went straight into the show after watching wow. like 66 episodes. And then I'm like, now I'm now I'm a massive fan and I'm really invested. And I got in the van and I'm driving to the North Shore. My first scene was like in the jungle. And so I go into the jungle and I'm sitting on the chair just sort of waiting because they were filming. And I look down and the dog, the, the what's he called? What was the dog called? Vincent. Vincent came Vincent. over to me. Yeah. And I got like really starstruck. I'm like, oh my God, it's you. Oh. And he sort of sat next to me and I'm like, be cool, be cool. <laughs> and then I looked at him, I hear like, cut, cut, cut. And I look up. And everybody that was about to shoot, that it was in the shit, the scene that I was doing, my first scene, they all just come like walking out of the jungle towards me. And you were like Sawyer and Locke and Kate all came walking towards me. And I'm sitting there with Vincent just going, <laughs> like, how do you go from watching it to then just, cl- it was like I'd climbed into my laptop. It was so weird. It was so weird. And that was, yeah. that was the day that Benjamin Linus, the first scene I shot was when Benjamin Linus shot me in the chest. And luckily, I was wearing a bulletproof vest, so couldn't get rid of me. Yeah, <laughs> that bulletproof vest thing. I love how, by the way, in that first the first scene that airs in the episode, when you're coming in on the helicopter, mm. it, it, it's, it's hard to even hear what's happening. But I think what's happening is you yelling, "I don't have my vest. I can't find my vest." And Miles says, "Ken Lung says, here, take mine." And then that turns out to be so important because it, it saves your life later in the episode. Absolutely. God, that's, that stunt was crazy when I was like supposed to be like falling out of the helicopter and I was caught upside down. I ended up having to go to the, yeah, talk about I that. ended up having to go to the hospital because of, <laughs> oh my God. funny now what? looking back on it, but I thought I had like bleeding on my brain. <laughs> I swear to God. Oh. Cause like, what, 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 how did they do the stunt? Well, thankfully they had this really hot Russian chick do the actual fall cause Disney wouldn't let me do <laughs> that part. <laughs> so she did the fall off, you know through the air, boom, into the lake underneath. But I, then I did stuff on, um, on blue screen where I was in a harness upside down doing the whole thing. And then I released my, my thing and then went down. So I only dropped like six feet, but we did it so many times that it was like gunk, gunk, Ooh. up again, gunk. And then, and then in between takes, I'd just like chill out upside down, you know. And then the next day, I'm like, I don't feel right. And like, I felt really, really weird. And then I called, I called the production office, and they're like, yeah, you might, you might need to go to hospital. And I had to have an MRI. And the doctor oh, said, I, they said, everything looks normal, um, but I think you've just really pissed off your brain. <laughs> I'm like, he's like, okay. that's, that's a very scientific diagnosis. It was. You pissed it off. Was. <laughs> Lots yeah. of years in medical school for that one. <laughs> you know, I, I, I was watching, you know, we were both watching all of, you know, those, those scenes you did earlier in season four and, you know, stuff like hanging from the tree and getting shot and, you know, shooting at people in the jungle was, you look like you're having fun. Was that stuff fun yeah. generally? Yeah. God, it was. It really, 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 really was. I love, I mean, I love doing my own stunts. You know, sometimes I have sort of hurt myself, but there's just something really exciting about it. You know, like even on Lost, you know, like dodging arrows with fireballs on them. Mm-hmm. There was one point one went right across my face and so I was like, well, sorry, I forgot to tell you that there was going to be one. I'm like, good to know, but I love it. I mean, it was such a sort of tomboy character, you know, and I had just yeah. come off of a show where I was playing an American defense attorney and I was in like $2,000 suits that at the time I could, I mean, like, who spends that money on a suit, you know? And I'd gone from wearing stilettos and suits. And, and I remember at the end of that show, it was a Jerry Bruckheimer show. And I'm like, I'm so sick of bloody hair and makeup and heels and suits. Next role, I want to be in jeans. I want to have no makeup on and bloody jeans. And I was like, yeah, all right, Rebecca, calm down. And literally, like, three months later, I was got no makeup on in jeans. But then I ended up wearing that outfit for, like, four years. <laughs> because we all wore the same outfit for a really long time. And then, oh, you know, so a few episodes in, I'm like, I miss makeup. I miss heels. It's like typical actor. Give them a job and they find something to complain about, you know. You manifested it. it. <laughs> I did, girl. I would manifested it. <laughs> Very nice. Oh, jeez. So when, when you walk, when Charlotte and her, her sort of helicopter companions show up on the island, I mean, it is, 
you and, and your fellow cast members, like you said, walking into this cast of stars at this point who are super popular and super well established. And mm. then in the plot, too, it's this like huge turning point and this introduction of, of a totally new set of characters, which we mm-hmm. haven't really seen mm-hmm. except in ones and twos yet. Um, what was it like to like drop into this cultural phenomenon like that? I mean, it really felt like I had climbed into the show. You know, if I hadn't have really watched it, I would have been like, oh, these people are nice and this seems like a nice job. But I'd become, I'd made myself become so invested that it felt like I had gone in to like a flash sideways to an alternate reality where I'd taken a drug and then was tripping my balls off, but then never came down. And then I was just inside the show and I'm like, how the fuck did I get here? Like, what? It was so weird. And it was like, it was like I'd always been there. I never felt like all the new, because sometimes, you know, when you start a new job, especially if it's a pre-existing show, you know, you can feel like the new girl. It sort of feels like, you know, first day of school or you've, you've moved to a new school halfway through a year and, you know, you don't quite fit in. But I never felt that way. Everyone was so kind and down to earth and just normal people. There was no wankers and everyone just was just really, really made me feel really, really welcome. And I mean, I remember I had this funny moment with Terry O'Quinn on my first day, like right after I'd been shot. And I'm like, what? And I was lying on the floor and he had his knees like he's like straddling me on top of me and like ripping my coat open and see that, you know, I'm not dead. And I've got, you know, been saved by this bulletproof vest. And then we cut and I looked up. And I, all I could see, and Locke was always my favourite character. I just, I, and I, and not only that, like as a person, he's strong choice. He's just such a magical human being as a person that you're like, I'm so glad that the human being matches the character. Like I was so in love with him, and I'm lying there, and he's like straddling me, and I've just finished the 66th episode, and I'm looking up, and all I see is this beautiful bald head. And he's like green, blue eyes. And then all this jungle and a little bit of sky right behind his head, like a halo, like, oh, and I'm like, how did I get here? Whoa. (laughs) I'm like, I don't want to come down from this high. It was such a magical moment. And anyway, we cut and then he helped me get up. And then we were doing another another part of the scene and the director never said cut, but, you know, we'd gotten to the end of the scene. So we just carried on talking because the director never said cut. So I just started taking the piss out of him. I'm like, oh, I'm Terry O'Quinn. I'm one of the main characters. Everybody loves me. <laughs> Eventually. And then the director's like, cut, cut. And he looked at me and he went... Welcome to Lost. <laughs> He's like, wicked. She can take the piss. Amazing. We like you. So that was that was really cool. And it, you know, I mean, it's just even like the da- a lot of things I remember about it was some of the funnest moments were like the downtime, like how we spent because mm-hmm. there was so much time just sitting. I mean, there is anyway in this business, but just sitting and waiting and like they had to like dress the jungle, light the jungle, light the trees, light, you know, light everything. And the lighting would take forever because these poor guys had to schlep all this stuff through mud and forage and it would take a while to set up. So like Terry O'Quinn and Josh Holloway would bust out their guitars and then we'd all start singing and accidentally, weirdly, all of a sudden there would be a beer and a red cup next to me. Don't know how that happened. So we're like (laughs) singing and drinking. It's like four o'clock in the morning. The stars are out. And then, like, a PA would come over, like, um, hey, guys, uh, we're ready for you on set. And we're, like, we're really nailing the bridge right now. If you could just just let us finish the song. Because <laughs> it just felt like we were hanging out. It was so much fun. So another another thing we're curious about, just in terms of your portrayal of the character, I mean, when you when you come into the show, there's all this, there's obviously a lot of mystery. Who are these people? What are their motivations? I, I'm assuming that at that point you probably didn't know that much more about Charlotte's backstory than, you know, than, than anyone else. Mm -hmm. How, you know, how how did you go about trying to play this character and, you know, what she's about and why she's there when, you know, you're sort of working in probably an information vacuum? It was sort of like guerrilla filmmaking because we, I I never knew anything and none of us knew anything. And you, you only found out what was happening as the scripts were coming out. And then, you know, back then they weren't emailed. You got a hard physical copy and you'd frantically look to say, am I going to die today? Am I not going to die? Because initially I was only supposed to do eight episodes 
and then it, it kind of went on from there. And me and the three others, the, our title, like in the scripts, we were called the freighter folk because we had come off that freighter. Um, so it really was a really cool acting lesson because because I never knew really who I was, why I was, where I was, when it was. I didn't know anything. <laughs> and so I really, you know, I couldn't get sort of too attached as an actor to the idea of who is Charlotte? Why is she here? Because if I'd, ma- if I'd focused too much on sort of creating my own backstory, that was never going to be as good as what Damon and Carlton were going to hand me. So I really just, it taught me, which I've used since in my career, to just really just say, fuck it and just surrender it and I just went with the flow and just just tried to stay really present in that character and just kind of go along for the ride and it really mm. it really freed me up it was really quite liberating actually to not like people like yeah. oh my backstory oh what does it all mean I'm like I don't know why I speak Korean whatever <laughs> <laughs> I, I never found out why I could speak Korean but who cares <laughs> Yeah. I take it you, you don't actually speak Korean. No, you? I get the you script know. and it's okay. like, and then Charlotte speaks Korean. I'm like, oh no. Aww. And then like the next day I've got this really cute Korean guy at my hotel room dog. I'm here to help you t- teach you Korean. I'm like, come on in. Yeah, it was crazy. <laughs> oh, jeez. It's funny. Well, I mean, I think that to me, one of the reason I partly the reason I asked that question is just, you know, knowing knowing what ends up being your backstory and watching those early episodes. When you get to the island, you seem like kind of excited to be there and kind of mischievous and kind of, you know, just like excited to see what happens next when you're not getting shot. And I just kind of feel like, OK, like this actually tracks with what we end up finding out about Charlotte, that she always wanted to come back here and find where she was born mm-hmm. and the whole female Indiana Jones thing, which which I think you actually say later in the show when you, you come back for the flash sideways. It's on so a I, date with Sawyer, know. isn't it? Yes. It is on a date yeah. with Sawyer. <laughs> but it was funny because they made a mistake um, with my date with Sawyer. They said, you know, that, that's why I became... Um, <laughs> I was reading it and I'm like, that's not right. It said, that's why I became an archaeologist. I'm like, email. I'm like, I'm an anthropologist. They're like, oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, good catch, Mater. <laughs> and I would always do that. Like, I'd find mistakes and holes and, like, I'd, I'd always do that. I'm such a dork. And um, Damon and Carlton did a YouTube video once taking the piss out of me. And Carlton sitting at his office and Damon comes running in. He's like, oh, no. And he's like, what happened? He's like, Mater read the script again. He's like, oh, what does she find this time? <laughs> Jeez. Uh, so you were following did, did you by the way this is you know that first scene the very first scene that you do you know besides the helicopter when you find the polar bear in the desert yeah yes yeah yeah and and there's the dharma caller did did it blow your mind as much as it did everyone else's <laughs> later in the season when ben transports himself off the island and ends up in the tunisian desert yeah. in that same spot it was, did that, it was really okay. really trippy yeah because that that Okay. That had sort of just sort of dangled in the air by itself. So I like that it then came back later on. That I really, I really thought that was cool. Yeah, okay. I was really invested, but I kind of ruined Lost for me, for myself mm. because I don't. I find I have a really hard time watching myself. So I, I was a massive fan of the show, and then all of a sudden my stupid face pops up, and my gin, <laughs> and my ginger hair. And I'm like, what, what's what's that all about? I'm so critical of myself. You know, instead of watching the scene, I'm like. Why is my left nostril flapping? Why is my right out eyebrow doing that? Do I need Botox? And I'm just not even watching the scene. Oh, <laughs> so in, I, I've never, I've never done a rewatch, which I mm. really, really, really want to do. And a pandemic is the perfect time to do it. So I'd like to do that because my husband's never seen the show. How sad is that? <laughs> oh, wow. wow! No, people don't believe. It. I'm like, yeah, you know, if we're out and about meeting people, I'm like, yeah, actually, my husband's never seen it. They're like. And what? He married you? He has, he has no idea. He's like, no, he doesn't care. <laughs> I think you have like an ethical obligation here to introduce him to the show. Yeah. I think it would be really cool to see it. Um, oh, what's that? Um, to see it like this, like this much time later on, all this time has passed. But I remember when we were shooting that scene in the flash sideways with me and Sawyer, I just had this flash of this memory and I was sitting next to the camera and they were changing the spool and I was talking to the A camera operator and he was telling me that Lost was the last TV show to shoot on film. Wow. Ever. Yeah, yeah. You know, you'd see the whole thing like, and you could hear that, like, that whir and everything. So I took a picture of me 
next to this camera with the big round things like that and I'm like wow I'm never gonna I'm never gonna see that again and like you know whenever you they whenever you're on set and they say cut they say check the gate but there is no gate with a digital you can just keep on rolling there is no worrying about if there's like a little tiny hair you know what I mean it's just it's it's so different but all the film terminology still stands they've kept all that so that was cool to be a part of that that's kind of an iconic thing so that was part one, as we said, of our conversation with Rebecca Mader. Uh, more to come. I just want to say that I think that uh, There Were No Wankers would be a <laughs> great title for an oral history of the making of Lost. <laughs> just talking, I mean, that, that her expression of, you know, talking about how everyone on set was such a good person, how they all got along together. There were no wankers. I love that. I love, I that. love yeah, and I, I love the way she talks about just kind of being dropped into this show that's already so well established and has such a devout following and feeling like constantly starstruck and like she's living in a dream. And it's just like, like, of course it would feel that way. That makes perfect sense. And, um, right. It makes you feel like, Oh, she's just like you and me, you or me. That's how I would have felt if I had been dropped into (laughs) last. Like, Holy shit. John Locke is standing over me with that big, beautiful bald head. What the fuck? Oh, geez. Yeah. That extremely relatable. (laughs) Oh, geez. We have a pretty amazing stable of, uh, of guests lined up this year. Uh, as thrilled. we said, you know, a couple more episodes of Rebecca Mader. We will also have Michael Emerson back on later this season to talk about the shape of things to come and other great Ben Linus moments. We've even got Roland Sanchez, who worked as a costume designer, which is a fascinating perspective. And some other uh, special guests who uh, we are not going to tell you yet, but I think you will be very excited by. We'll be back in your feed next Tuesday with Confirmed Dead. Uh, in the meantime, if you have a hot take that you'd like to share with us, we will play it on the show, 9546-DHARMA. Call and leave us a voicemail. You could also follow us on social media if you don't already. You can find us on Twitter at The Hatch Podcast, Facebook.com slash The Hatch Podcast as well. We'd love to hear from you there. If you wouldn't mind dropping a rating and review in Apple Podcasts or the podcast app of choice, that'll help other people find the show and we'd appreciate it. Our theme music is by Andy G. Cohen. Our cover art is by Danny Roth. See you next week. Namaste. Mm-hmm.